can you steal man? The case that uh, the prime minister of this country, Trudeau, wants the best for this country and actually might do good things for this country as okay. an intellectual challenge. Sure. Um, he seems to get along well with his wife. He has some kids. There's no sexual scandals. And he's in a position where that could easily be the case. He seems to have done some good things on the oceanic management front. He's put a fair bit of Canada's oceans into marine protected areas, and that might be his most fundamental legacy, if it's real. I've been trying to get information about the actual reality of the protection, and I haven't been able to do that. But that's a good thing. So sorry, the family thing yeah. is, there's it some speaks aspect- speaks to his of, character. His character, there is some aspect to him who's that makes him a good man well, in that sense. Well, I mean, there's the evidence there, you know. I mean, he's not a Jeffrey Epstein profligate on the sexual front, so that's something. And mm -hmm. his wife, they seem to have a real marriage, and he has kids, so, you know, good for him. That's a good um, start, by the way, for a leader. Yeah, right. To be a right. good man. Well, then I also thought, okay, well, after the liberals had brought in a Harvard intellectual who was a Canadian to be their last leader, he didn't work out. And then they're flailing about for a leader. And the liberals in Canada are pretty good at maintaining power and leadership and have been the dominant governing party in Canada for a long time. And so they went to Justin and said... Well, you know, it's you are a conservative, and you can imagine that's not a positive um, specter for someone who's on the left, or even a liberal, especially, and Trudeau's quite a bit on the left, and uh, they said, we need you to run, and then I thought, okay, well, the answer to that should have been no, because the Trudeau, Justin, has no training for this, no experience. He's not, he's a part-time drama teacher, fundamentally. He hadn't run a business. He just didn't know enough to be prime minister. But then I'm trying to put myself in his position. Eh? So it's like, okay, I don't know enough, but I'm young and we don't want the conservatives. And they had had a run, a 10 year run. So maybe it was time for a new government. I could, maybe I could grow into this man. Maybe I could surround myself with good people and I could learn humbly and I could become the person I'm now pretending to be, which we all have to do as we move forward, right? And so and so then I thought, okay, I think you made a mistake there because you ran only on your father's name and you didn't have the background, but let's give the devil his due and say that's no problem. Mm -hmm. Okay, so now what do you do? Well, you get elected and your first act is to make the cabinet 50% women, despite the fact that only 25% of the elected Members are female. It's like, okay, you just halved your talent pool. That was a really bad move for your first move. Can, can I ask you about that? Yeah. Uh, do you think, where does that move come from? Deep somewhere in the heart? Or no. is, it, is it trying to listen to the social forces that of the moment and try to ride those ways you towards maybe greater like greater popularity? By th after thinking it through. It's like, no, you just halved your talent pool for cabinet positions. That's what you did. There's enough cabinet positions. You know, you could argue that each of them met threshold. It's like, there's a big difference between threshold and excellent. So you don't think that that came from a place of compassion? Do I don't care if it did. Compa I don't regard compassion as a virtue. Compassion is a reflex, not a virtue. You don't think- Judicious comp compassion is a virtue. Wait, wait a minute, wait a minute. Compassion can come deep from the human heart and the human mind, I think. Are we talking about the same kind of compassion? Yes. Trying to understand the suffering Treating of the adults world. like infants is not virtuous. I, I see, but you're, you're, you, well, compassion isn't treating adults like infants. I mean, those are just terms. Are you, are you but, sure? Okay, I, whatever the term is, maybe edible, love, love is maybe the Edible compassion word. is. I mean, I, I suppose I'm speaking to love. You don't think those ideas came from concern. Love is compassion. You don't think love is a blend of compassion and encouragement and truth. Love's complicated, truth. man. Yeah, if I love you, in it, yes. if I love you, is it compassion or encouragement you want from me? Yeah, the dance. Love, love is definitely a dance of two two humans. Ultimately, that leads to the growth of both. Well, yes. that's the thing. The growth element is crucial. Yeah, because the growth element to foster the growth element that requires judgment, compassion, and judgment. Well, even. 
and have been conceptualized this way forever, two hands of God, mercy and justice. They have to operate in tandem, right? And mercy is flawed as you are, you're acceptable. It's like, well, do you want that? Do you want your flaws to be acceptable? And the answer to that is no. It's so it's like, well, that's where the judgment comes in. It's like, but you could be better. You could be more than you are. And that's the maternal and the paternal in some fundamental sense. And there has to be a active exchange of information between those two poles. So even if even if Trudeau was motivated by compassion, it's like, yeah, just how loving are you, first of all? No, it was a really bad decision. And then he and he's expressed contempt for monetary policy. I'm not interested in monetary policy. It's like, okay, but you're a prime minister. And he's expressed admiration for the Chinese Communist Party because they can be very efficient in their pursuit of environmental goals. It's like, oh yeah, efficiency, eh? The efficiency of the tyranny in the service of your terror. And so, and I've watched him repeatedly and I've listened to him a lot and I've tried to do that clinically and with some degree of dispassion. And that's hard too, because his father, Pierre, devastated the West in 1982 with the national energy policy. And Trudeau is doing exactly the same thing again. And so as a Westerner as well, I have an inbuilt animus and one that's well-deserved because Central Canada, especially the glittery, literati elite types in the Ottawa, Montreal, Toronto triangle have exploited the West and expressed contempt for the West far too much for far too long. And that's accelerating at the moment, for example, with Trudeau's recent attack on the Canadian farmers. He's an enemy of the oil and, and, and gas industry. It's an utter and absolute bloody catastrophe. And look what's happened in Europe, at least in partial consequence. And he's no friend to the farmers. So I've tried to steel man him, you know. I try to put myself in the position of the people that I'm criticizing. I think he's a narcissist. Do you think there's a degree to which power changed him? If you're not suited for the position, if you're not the man for the position, you can be absolutely 100% sure that the power will corrupt you. How could it not? I mean, at the, at the least, if you don't have the chops for the job, you have to devalue the job to the point where you can feel comfortable inhabiting it. So... Yes, I think that it's corrupted him. And I mean, look at him doubling down. Mm -hmm. We wear masks in, in flights into Canada. We have to fill out an arrive can bureaucratic form on our phones because a passport is go isn't good enough. We can't get a passport. What if you're 85 and you don't know how to use a smartphone? Oh, well, too bad for you. Yeah. It's like, yes, it's corrupted him. Would you talk to him? Well, uh, if you were to sit down and talk with him and he wanted to talk, uh, would you, and what kind of things would you talk about, perhaps on your podcast? I don't think I've ever said no to talking to anyone. So, which is, you know. Would you, <laughs> would that be a first or would you, would you make that conversation? Do you believe in the power of no, I'd ask in him. those kinds of contexts? No, if, if, if. If he was willing to talk to me, I'd talk because I'd like to ask him. I have lots of things I'd like to ask him about. I mean, I've had political types in Canada on my podcast and tried so to ask them questions. To so understand. I'd like to know. Is there you know, something... maybe I've got a big part of him wrong. Yes. And I probably do. But my observation has been that every chance he had to retreat from his pharaonic position, let's say, he doubled down. And these... Our parliament is not running for the next year. It's still Zoom in. It's still COVID lockdown parliament for the next year. It's already been fatally compromised, perhaps, by the lockdowns for the last couple of years. And this is parliament we're talking about. Yeah, There's a kind of um, par paralysis, fear-driven paralysis that also... In part, some of the most brilliant people I know are lost in this paralysis. I don't think people assign a word to it, but it's almost like a fear of this unknown thing that lurks in the shadows. And that, unfortunately, that fear is leveraged by people um, 
that you know who are in in academic circles, who are in faculty or students and so on, are more in administration, and they they start to use that fear, which makes me uh, quite uncomfortable. It it does lend people in the positions of power who are not good at handling that power to become slowly, day by day, a little bit more corrupt. I was really trying to figure out, you know, the last two weeks thinking this through. It's like, how do you know? Let's say someone asked me a question in, in the YouTube comment. I said, why, why, why can I trust your advice on the environmental front? And I thought, that's a really good question. Okay. Let's see if we can figure out the principles by which the advice would be trustworthy. Okay, how how do you know it's not trustworthy? Well, one potential response to that would be the claims are not in accordance with the facts. But, you know, facts are tricky things, and it depends on where you look for them. So that's a tough one to get right, because, for example, Lomberg's fundamental critics argue about his facts, not just his interpretation of them. So that can't be an unerring guide. And so I thought, well, the facts exact, exactly doesn't work because when it's about everything, there's too many facts. So then how do you determine if someone's a trustworthy guide in the face of the apocalyptic unknown? Because that's really the question. And the answer is, they're not terrified tyrants. I think that's the answer. Now, maybe that's wrong. If someone has a better answer, How do you hey, know if they're a terrified tyrant? Because they're the willing to use compulsion on other people when they could use goodwill. Like, the farmers in Canada objected. They said, look, we have every economic reason to use as little fertilizer as we can because it's expensive. We have satellite maps of where we put the fertilizer. We have cut our fertilizer use so substantially in the last 40 years, you can't believe it, and we grow way more food. We're already breaking ourselves in half. And if you know farmers, especially the ones who still survive, you think you think those people don't know what they're doing. It's like, yeah, they're pretty damn sophisticated, man. Like, way more sophisticated than our prime minister. And now you tell them, no, it's a 30% reduction. And we don't care how much food you're growing. So it's not a reduction that's dependent on amount of food produced per unit of fertilizer used, which would be at least, you could imagine it. So, okay, so you're producing this much food and you use this much fertilizer, so you're hyper-efficient. Maybe we take the 10% of farmers who are the least efficient in that metric and we say to them, you have to get as efficient as the average farmer. And then they say, well, look, you know, our, our situation's different. We're in a more Northern clime. The soil's weaker you know, you, you obviously have to bargain with that, but at least, at least you reward them for their productivity. Well, it's like, well, Holland isn't going to have beef. Well, where are they going to get it? Well, you don't need it. It's like, oh, I see. You get to tell me what I can eat now, do you? Really? Okay. And w Holland is going to import food from where that's more efficient on the fertilizer front? There's no one more efficient than Holland. And same with Canada? And like, isn't this going to make food prices more expensive? And doesn't that mean that hungry people die? Because that is what it means. So, so ultimately, poor people pay the price of these kinds of policies. No, uh, not no, not ultimately. Today. Now, today, today, that's a crucial distinction because they say, well, ultimately, the poor will benefit. Yeah, except the dead ones. Yes, I, today. Today, right. 